Hi. Hello again. We've reached chapter 17 in In Search of Christian Freedom by Ray Friends. The heading of this chapter is The Challenge of Christian Freedom. And Ray begins with two passages from the Revised Standard Version. First John, that is the Gospel of John, chapter 8, verses 31, 32, and 36. If you continue in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. If the Son makes you free, you will be free indeed. And from 2 Corinthians 3, verse 17, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. So Ray begins, followers of God's Son should be lovers of the freedom he gives, should cherish it, defend it, sacrifice whatever is necessary to retain it. That freedom is more than political freedom. It frees us from the frustration brought by enslavement to decadence, from the sense of guilt before God, from the fear of death, and from the fear of man or devil. For it carries with it the hope to be freed from the shackles of mortality and enter upon the liberty and splendor of the children of God. That's the New English Bible version of Romans 8, verse 21. It is also the freedom to be the person we truly desire to be, strive to be, a person who reflects the life of the one each of us follows, though expressly individual, expressed individually as the unique personalities we are. Paul was not a Peter, and Peter was not a John, nor was Mary a Priscilla, or Priscilla a Dorcas. Yet each reflected in his or her life the teachings and qualities and spirit of the one they followed, the one in whom they placed faith as the Son of God. There is a beauty to such individuality, a beauty that imposed conformity and rigid uniformity with their, with, with their depersonalizing and sometimes dehumanizing effect, smother and suppress. Rather than being like peas in a pod, people can be like flowers in a garden, distinctive, various, even contrasting, yet neither weed-like, ugly, nor ill-smelling, and all blending together to contribute to the loveliness of the garden as a whole. Totalitarian control, whether political or religious, fears individuality views it as a threat. That fear is a sign of weakness, not of strength. Similarly, falsehood fears truth, shrinks away from its light, seeks to hide from it. It may, either aggressively or by devious means, try to blot out that light, but seeks to evade meeting truth face to face in honest contest. Unity based on a forced uniformity, though solid in outward appearance, is actually fragile. Unlike the unity based on truth and on love, the perfect bond of union, such imposed unity has no inner natural strength. It survives only through manipulation, coercion, and fear. I think here of a letter from a woman in California who, with her daughters, had studied with witnesses and began to share in meetings and engage in door-to-door field service. She wrote, quote, I have been studying with the witnesses for about a year and have been under ever-increasing pressure to fall into line with all the organizational views. What started out to be a pleasant and informative Bible study has become a suffocating as a suffocating of our own spiritual identity. It is interesting that while feeling this kind of pressure, it becomes difficult to think Clearly, a fear has been planted that we would be following Satan's system and moving away from the God-inspired organization. End of quote. It is easy to render lip service to the example set by individuals of the past who, often at a great cost to themselves, did not allow intimidation to keep them from seeking truth and making it known. Watch our publications frequently contain articles commending the integrity to truth and conscience that earlier martyrs and reformers displayed, men like Wycliffe, Tyndale, Michael Servetus, or John Hus, 
who resisted the choking power of religious censorship went uncowed by the coercive pressure and condemnation of religious authority. Other articles speak approvingly of various breakaway, nonconformist minority groups, such as the Waldenses, the Lollards, the Anabaptists, all of whom declared themselves as placing loyalty to scriptural truth above loyalty to above loyalty to organizational authority and teaching. In all this, however, one cannot but be impressed by the parallel with those religious authorities in Jesus' day, who, as he said, built tombs for the prophets and decorated the graves of righteous men in the past, and said, if we had lived in the times of our ancestors, we should never have joined in the killing of the prophets. Despite their professions, the course of those religious leaders showed that they had the same spirit as their ancestors, who brought about the death of the organizationally rejected prophets. In parallel fashion, while honoring those dissenting individuals and nonconformist groups of the past, the Watchtower organization employs the identical weapons that were used against them, organizational censorship, intimidation, pressure, coercion, and excommunication to silence any attempt today Oh, to silence any att- yeah to silence any attempt today at free open discussion of the validity of its teachings and exercise of authority those it now labels as heretical are to be viewed as dead by all its members it praises the courage that made men and women in the past hold to their convictions condemns the same course now as born of a disruptive prideful spirit as evidence of rebellion against God, and in doing so uses language strongly reminiscent of the ecclesiastical condemnations of the past. Yet human history is surely the richer for containing the examples of such men and women of conscience set in their stand for freedom. Now Ray has talked earlier in the book about these same examples mm-hmm. that the Watchtower continually uses and we made a video of that section of the book it was something along the lines of J.W. Ward gropes through the fog of history for their spiritual ancestors mm-hmm. so I'll put that up on your screen but also another one in the same sequence of, of uh, thought in Ray's book earlier did the slave class feed Russell based on the concept that Each there's always there's been always a slave throughout Mm -hmm. all of Christian history and from one generation to another the slave fed the next generation of slave. Mm -hmm. So those two videos are on your screen. Next time I'm attaining spiritual growth as free persons.